In section 0.6, I will be discussing many of the procedures and skills that you'll need to utilize during lab experiments. This video shows another high school physics teacher discussing some of the aspects of a quality experiment. I will be covering the basics of what he discusses in the next three slides. I do recommend that you watch it because he discusses these aspects in a context of a real experiment. In a lab experiment, our goal should be to learn or measure something meaningful. If our lab is well designed and carefully carried out, then we can be confident that the results of the experiment are meaningful. In the next few slides, I will discuss the three aspects that all good lab experiments should have. And throughout the year, I will do my best to present opportunities for you to practice designing, performing, and analyzing lab experiments. So these aspects are sort of the goals that I'd like you to have uh, during, a, during a lab experiment. The first aspect of a good experiment is validity. You should remember that in the scientific method, an experiment is designed to test a hypothesis. A valid experiment is one that is designed in a way that its results provide a way to disprove a hypothesis. It, if the experiment disproves the hypothesis, then the scientific method says that we need a new hypothesis to test. If the hypothesis is not disproved, then we say that the experiment is consistent with the hypothesis. And I want to make it clear that experiments do not prove hypotheses. A failure to disprove a hypothesis is generally uh, increases our confidence that the hypothesis is correct, but generally more investigation is required for a hypothesis to be accepted as correct. Further marks of a valid uh, a valid experiment is that it uses suitable equipment to measure the data and you have appropriate precision. Variables must be controlled so that we're only testing an independent and a dependent variable. All other va uh, variables need to be kept constant. And it uses appropriate, me appropriate measuring procedures. The second aspect of a quality experiment is reliability. A reliable experiment is one that produces results that can be obtained consistently, and a well-designed experiment will yield similar results if it is repeated multiple times. It's, also, it's often a good idea to try to measure the same thing in multiple different ways. For example, we might measure the weight of an object using different scales. If different scales report similar measurements for the weight of an object, then we can be more confident that we are making high quality measurements. The third aspect of a quality experiment is accuracy. We can describe the accuracy of an experiment uh, if it yields results that are close to the true value of what we are measuring. We can be more confident in the accuracy of our results if we perform repeated independent measurements of the same thing. For example, many of our experiments this year will measure gravitational acceleration or the rate at which uh, a falling object accelerates downward. There's an expected value of 9.8 meters per second squared for this quantity. And the final step in most labs will be to measure the accuracy of your results. We do this by calculating a percent or relative error, which measures how close the value that you measured is to the known or expected value. In an experiment, there are two types of measurements. A direct measurement is a value that's measured by some device that does not involve any calculation. For example, we might make a measurement with a scale, such as a ruler, to measure the length of an object. Or we can use a device that reports measurements with a digital readout, like a stopwatch, for measuring time. Any direct measurement will have some inherent limit as to the precision of that measurement. For a scale measurement, the precision is mostly determined by the size of the smallest mark on the scale. For example, some rulers have markings every quarter inch, while some rulers have markings every millimeter. Because a millimeter is smaller than a quarter inch, the millimeter ruler is more precise than the quarter inch ruler. The precision of a device with a digital readout is related to how many decimal places that the device reports measurements. A calculated measurement is a value that's calculated from two or more direct measurements. For example, you might have to measure the speed of a moving object by measuring the distance that it moves in some amount of time. Because there's a limit to the precision in both the distance and the time measurements that you make, uh, 
there is going to be a related limit to the precision uh, for um, the measurement of speed. I'll discuss how to find the precision of a calculated measurement in a later slide. The precision of a measurement refers to the degree that a measurement can be repeated. You can indicate the measurement, uh, the precision of a measurement by using sig figs, or alternatively, you can use something called uncertainty. To introduce the concept of uncertainty in measurement, I'm going to use this example. How long is this paper clip? Is it two centimeters? Or can we be more precise than that? I think what I'm asking is, can we express the measurement with more decimal places? It's hard to say exactly what that next decimal place needs to be. I can be fairly certain that it's not 2.1 centimeters, and I'm very certain that it's not 2.9 centimeters. Uh, so it's clear that the digit in the tenths place is an estimated digit. And I hope that it's clear that because we're estimating the digit in the tenths place, that it's not appropriate to, uh, to estimate a digit in the hundredths place. At best, uh, the best that we can do is to measure one extra decimal place. So let's say that we claim that the length of the paper clip was two centimeters. What are we really saying by that? Well, what we're saying is that uh, we're confident that the measurement is longer than 1.5 centimeters. If it was less than that, we would report it as one centimeter. We're saying that it's shorter than 2.5 centimeters. If it was bigger than that, then we would report it as three centimeters. And so in other words, uh, we're saying that a measurement of two centimeters means that the actual length of the paper clip is somewhere between one and a half centimeters and two and a half centimeters. Or to put another way, I'm saying that it's confident that we are within a half centimeter of two centimeters. And that plus or minus half a centimeter is referred to as the uncertainty in your measurement. Some people will refer to this as an error in measurement, but I prefer to use the word error in a different way. So I'm going to use the term uncertainty to mean our range of confidence in a measurement. As a brief discussion of notation, we can represent the uncertainty of a measurement with the lowercase Greek letter delta. So for a measurement, we can write it as a best estimate x plus or minus the uncertainty in the measurement delta x. Shown in the context of the length measurement of our paper clip, we can write the length as L plus or minus delta L, where delta L is the uncertainty in the measurement of the paper clip's length. The best way to quantify the precision of a measurement is by considering the measurement's percent uncertainty. The percent uncertainty of a measurement is found by dividing the uncertainty in the measurement by the value of the measurement itself. For example, we can uh, find the percent uncertainty in the length of our paper clip by dividing the uncertainty, or 0.5, by the value of the measurement, 2, and expressed as a percentage, this is a 25% uncertainty. Percent uncertainty is a good way to evaluate the precision of a measurement. As the percent uncertainty in a measurement becomes smaller, we can consider it to be more perfect or more precise, and this can happen in two ways. We can decrease the uncertainty or the measurement itself becomes larger. For example, you'd be correct in saying that our measurement for the length of the paper clip is not very precise. However, if we were to use the same ruler, to measure something with a much longer length, then the percent uncertainty would be much smaller and we could say that that is a much more precise measurement. So back to our paper clip. Maybe we can be more precise than just two centimeters. Maybe we can estimate another digit. When making a measurement on a scale device, it's usually okay to estimate one digit past the finest mark on the scale. However, you might not be able to do so reliably. You are measuring, the, if you're measuring the length of an object without well defined endpoints. Or maybe you're using a scale that has very fine marks that are very close together. Or maybe your eyesight can't make out the scale very clearly. These are all examples of when you might not want to estimate an extra digit. But if you are estimating an additional digit, you should typically record the measurement along with the uncertainty in that measurement. 
when measurements are recorded without an uncertainty, there is still an implied uncertainty. And as a rule of thumb, you infer the uncertainty of plus or minus the last digit that is shown. So, for example, a measurement of 2.0 centimeters, it is implied that the uh, uncertainty in that measurement is 0 0.1 centimeters. So what should we report for the measurement of the length of our paperclip? There is no one single answer that's correct. However, there are some general guidelines that you should follow. To me, the rightmost edge of the paperclip appears to be about halfway between the two and three centimeter marks, but it looks to be a little bit less than two and a half. I would likely report this as 2.3 centimeters. But when choosing to report my uncertainty, it's traditional to select plus or minus one, plus or minus two, or plus or minus five of my estimated digit. And I tend to be a little more conservative when I report my uncertainties. So I would be likely to report the uncertainty as 2.3 plus or minus 0 0.2 centimeters. This slide contains the two rules for reporting uncertainties. Uncertainty should be reported with only one significant digit. The exception to this rule is that if the first significant digit is a one, then you may report a second significant digit. Your best estimate for a measurement should always be reported to the same number of decimal places as your uncertainty. For example, can you find the error in this measurement? The error is that the uncertainty is shown with two significant digits, and the uncertainty should be rounded to one significant digit, or 0 0.02 in this case. Then the best estimate needs to be rounded uh, to two decimal places, or 0 0.24. Can you find the error in this measurement? Hopefully you notice that the best estimate has, has only two decimal places, while the uncertainty has only one decimal place. The best estimate should be rounded to one decimal place or 85.5. In this example, we're asked to measure the length of the cylinder. I can see that the rightmost end of the cylinder appears to be past the 2.7 centimeter mark. But I don't think that I can visually tell if it's close to the 2.7 centimeter mark or the 2.8 centimeter mark. So in this case, I should report it as a best estimate of 2.7 with an uncertainty of 0 0.1. This example asks us to report on another scale measurement. We should note that <clears throat> each of the longer marks on the scale represents 1 milliamp while the small marks will represent 0 0.2 milliamp. And to me, it appears that the arrow is pointing directly at the 1.6 milliamp tick. But I'm not able to estimate another digit beyond that, so I should not uh, go one decimal place further. So in this case, I should report the measurement as 1.6 plus or minus 0 0.2 milliamps. In lab experiments, we will frequently use the slope of graphs to measure things, and the slope of a graph also has uncertainty. When reporting the slope of a graph in a lab report, it's likely that you will have to round the value that Logger Pro displays. Here is an example. I'm going to need to round the slope of this graph because the uncertainty is shown with four significant digits. I should round the best estimate to the same decimal place is the uncertainty. In an experiment, if you have to find a calculated value from two or more direct directly measured values, you will have to come uh, you will have to combine the uncertainties of the direct measurements. And this is called propagation of uncertainty. 
There's several sets of rules for doing this, and we're going to use the most basic set of rules, but you will, be not, you will not be responsible for knowing these rules. If you have to propagate uncertainty in a lab, uh, then I'm going to provide a formula for you to show you how to use the rules shown in this table. And as an example, I'll show you how to use the slope of this graph and the rules of propagation of uncertainty to find a calculated measurement. If you recall from the last lecture, the slope of a distance versus time squared graph for an object that accelerates from rest is equal to half the acceleration. Therefore, the acceleration is going to equal twice the slope. And the uncertainty in the slope needs to be rounded to 0 0.04. And since we're finding the acceleration from the slope, and we're, we need to multiply the slope by two, the rule for multiplying by a constant says that we need to multiply the uncertainty by that same constant. So the uncertainty in the slope is 0 0.04. Using the rule, we're going to multiply that by two, which gives us an uncertainty in our measurement of 0 0.08. So we can report the acceleration as 3.16, plus or minus 0 0.08 meters per second squared. If we're comparing two measurements, we will say that two measurements are in agreement if the two measurements share any common values or if the ranges overlap. Uh, for example, are these two measurements in number one in agreement? The first measurement has a range of 2.4 to 2.8. The second has a range of 1.6 up to 2.6. And the ranges overlap between 2.4 and 2.6. Therefore, we can say that the two measurements are in agreement. How about the two measurements in number two? Are they in agreement? Well, the first range has a range of 8 to 12. And the second has a range from 13 to 15. And these two ranges do not overlap for any values and therefore these two measurements are not in agreement. And if two measurements are not in agreement, we will refer to them as being discrepant. In a lab experiment, if two measurements are discrepant, then you will need to quantify the discrepancy between the two measurements for your lab report. If the purpose of the lab report is to measure a quantity that has some theoretical or accepted value, then you should calculate a percent error for the discrepancy. If the purpose of the lab is to uh, measure the same thing with two independent methods, then you would calculate what's called a percent difference between the two measurements. In this example, part A asks to evaluate uh, this student's reporting for the density of pure water. The student has made an error in his or her reporting because he or she did not follow the rules for rounding with uncertainty. The uncertainty is listed with two significant digits, and that breaks the rules. The student should round the uncertainty to one significant digit, and we should then report the measurement as 995 plus or minus 6 kilograms per cubic meter. Part B asks us to evaluate whether the student's measurement is in agreement with the accepted value for the density of water. The measurement is in agreement with the accepted value, and this is because the accepted value of 997 falls within the range of the student's measurement. This example asks us to evaluate if uh, the measurements taken by two lab groups are in agreement. First, we should convert one of the lab group's measurements to the same units. I'll convert lab group number one's measurement by kilograms into grams. So I do so by multiplying both the best estimate and the uncertainty by 1,000. The uncertainty range for group number one is from 230 to 270. The uncertainty range for group two is from 280 to 1300. We should note that the ranges do not overlap for any values and therefore they are not in agreement. And because the measurements are discrepant 
and neither group's measurement can be considered an accepted value, we should be calculating a percent difference. Inserting the best estimates for each group's measurements into the percent difference formula, we can, met, we can calculate the percent difference between the two groups' measurements to be 3.1%. And that does it for this lecture. I know this was a very long section of notes, so thanks for sticking with me. Do not stress about the amount of information contained in this lecture. Most of these ideas and skills that I talked about here are going to be assessed during labs. So we're, we'll take everything a step at a time as we introduce these skills through labs. I don't plan on putting many questions on a test or a quiz assessing this material.